Welcome to Restored Gospels teaching series, The Final Prophecy. This is class two in this series titled, The Change of Heart. God's justice dictates that sin will separate us from Him eternally unless our sin is removed. Humanity had no power to remove our own sin. The cost of our sin required an infinite payment. Only the infinite and eternal God could pay the penalty of our sin so that mercy could overcome justice. But is that all that was required? How do humans respond to that sacrifice? God took on flesh and became a sacrifice to pay an infinite price, but specifically, how do we respond to that gracious gift so that salvation can be ours? The answer is beautifully revealed in Scripture, and the Book of Mormon completely explains the requirement. The requirement is that our hearts must change. That is, we must be born again. Mercy is freely applied for all who want to choose the ways of God by the renewing of the heart. But what does it mean for the heart to change? How does it begin and how do we recognize if it's happening within us? Stay tuned for the class to come as we unfold these answers from Scripture. And now, class number two of the Final Prophecy series, The Change of Heart. If you were here last, a month ago, we, <laughs> we asked a few questions. Started class with just a simple question, what makes God angry? And you know, there's different ways you can answer that question, but the ultimate answer was from the Book of Mormon, the phrase that God is angry with his people because they will not understand of his mercies because of Jesus Christ. And it's, that was a startling scripture for me to read, just thinking you know, of all the things that could, God could be offended by that we just didn't understand how merciful he is. Um, it's something for us to consider as a people. We asked the question, what is justice? And we talked about the fact that justice is our problem. Justice is our problem because all the spirit of man with God in the beginning, Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God. When humans transgressed, we were cast out of God's presence because of justice. The laws that state no unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God. That justice became the result of mankind living outside of God's presence with the hope to return. But the only way justice can be paid was a price had to be paid. And the problem is the cost of the justice was an infinite penalty. There was not anything we in and of ourselves could do to overcome the price of our transgression. So it took, for an infinite cost, it took an infinite payment. And that <clears throat> is something we'll talk about a little bit more today. So when Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, death came upon mankind. Death being two things. One, they did not die as in fall to the ground dead. But that would happen eventually. Their, their temporal death was now assured. But more importantly, their spiritual death was now upon them. The death being the first death. First death being where we are separated from God. All mankind is living under the, the, the first death right now. We are all separated from God. God's goal is to help us, prevent us, from being victims of the second death. The second death being final separation for eternity. And in that final state, a soul that has sin that has not been removed or washed clean, as the scripture says, is forever miserable, forever aware of that sin, uh, full consciousness of that forever with no relief, no escape. And it says it's so bad that your torment is like a lake of fire. And all that happens because you are now never uh, able to come into God's presence because that sin is locked into one's soul permanently. So, so that is what God doesn't want to happen to us. Right? And that is why we're here. That's why we build churches and worship because we want to somehow live a life that hopefully helps us to be back in His presence. Right? But, but how does that really happen? What's our, what's our responsibility in this? And So, a couple of the scriptures, and this is again just previous, a uh, little bit of review. 
this is the scripture is the prophet Zenos whose writings come in pieces in the Book of Mormon they weren't mentioned in the Bible they must have been part of the brass plates Lehi brought from Jerusalem Zenos spoke and they quote him saying thou art angry O Lord with his people because they will not understand of thy mercies which thou hast bestowed upon them because of thy son and then the first death this death, this separation from God all mankind has suffered this first death and the spiritual death cut off from the presence of God Things, and this is a temporal and a spiritual condition but the second death the second death is an everlasting death and that's what we're trying to avoid the only way our penalty could be absolved for an infinite problem was with an infinite price. And Alice speaks and says, now the plan of mercy could not be brought about except an atonement should be made. Therefore God himself atoneth for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy, to appease the demands of justice, that God might be a perfect, a just God, and a merciful God also. God himself atoned for the sins of the world. I want to point something out here, and this just jumped out at me this last couple of weeks um, since our last class. You know, we, you know, there's a phrase in Second Nephi, it talks about a Bible, a Bible, we have a Bible, and, and all of us, I think, kind of remember that. But there's a real gem right in front of that that is part of that passage. And if you turn to Second Nephi 12, it's, it's something that is just, I, I want to say this as an umbrella over every scripture we're going to use. Um, Because the text for the next several classes is pretty much, well, it's the Book of Mormon and it's Old Testament. And there's a reason for that. It's because of the covenants that we're going to talk about. But I I want to, I I just want, this this helps me understand something. Because I, sometimes you can still read scripture. We've got, you know, three books of scripture. One written by the Jews, we call it the Bible. One written by the remnant of Joseph, we call it the Book of Mormon. One written by Latter Day Prophet. I mean, or, or prophets in the last days of doctrine and covenants, and and we all hold them to be God's word. But it, what this jumped out at me in Second Nephi twelve and uh, 42, 43, The Lord's talking about a time when He's going to set forth His hand again to recover His people, and and this is all why this whole book you've got is called the Final Prophecies, because the Final Prophecy is how God. <coughs> recovers his people, how God brings the world to him, all those who will obey, and, and how heaven and earth will come together again. I mean, that's what it's all leading up to. That's what, you know, there have been many, many prophecies through time that have already been fulfilled, but the final prophecy is yet to be fulfilled, and it's all of everything we're talking about leads to this, leads to this coming together of, of heaven and earth, of celestial uh, beings back, back dwelling on earth, but so God's going to set forth his hand to do this. And, but the way he does this is, is very interesting when you read verse 43, 2 Nephi 12, 43. He's speaking to Nephi and he says, I would that you remember your seed, that the words of your seed should proceed forth out of my mouth unto your seed. So he's saying the words that you're writing the, and, and that your family, your lineage is going to write are going to come back to your people. He said, they're, but they're going to come from my mouth to them. I, and this is something to happen in the last days, that the remnant of Joseph receives the word again, the very words that were written by their forefathers. But notice what he says. He said, these words, these words I'm talking about, in verse 44, my words shall hiss forth unto the ends of the earth for a standard unto my people. For a standard. So these words... These words of Joseph become the standard to Israel. And and perhaps more that's going to come forth from the Book of Mormon. But the point is, these words were preserved in purity. And even for the beautiful words that we have in the Bible, God tells us, he said, when they came forth from the the 12 apostles to the world, they came forth in their fullness and in their purity. He said, but, but they were manipulated through time. And he even mentions this this great and abominable church, he said, when they came forth from them, he said, the Gentiles who received these words stumbled greatly. 
because of some of the plain and precious truths that were removed and the covenants too. And, and these are all scriptures that we're going to get to in time. But the point I'm making is that we're holding in our hands the standard already that's going to become the standard of the world and they don't know it. And it's a beautiful thing that we've got this word. So, so I'm, I'm calling the Book of Mormon the standard, all right? It's, it's the truth. It's, the, it's, it's, it's where we can turn to to resolve our issues of doctrine. And, and, and it tells a beautiful story of what Jesus is planning to do in days to come. So talking about the justice that we're cast out of God's presence. I'm talking about that an infinite payment needed to be made. So, so where do we fit into this? What, what's our response? You know, and you, you look to the, the churches of the world, and you know, some will say, well, you, you got to be able to speak in tongues. <laughs> or some will say, you got to be able to dance with a snake. You know, that happens sometimes too. And I, I just read one recently. There's this new group of people. It's weird. Um, grave soaking. All right, they believe that you need to lay down, believe it or not, on the, on the burial place of former saints, and by laying on the ground there, you will absorb spiritual energy from them and understand and become one with them. It's crazy, but there's people preaching that. There's, pre- there's churches that have always preached, hey, for your money, you'll be forgiven of your sins, so just please put a little more in the plate. Or say enough prayers, or do, do it enough things. Some say there's nothing you have to do. They just say, hey, Jesus did it all, and, and I don't have to do anything. And that's one of the biggest fallacies. See, what's true is that because mankind was cast out of God's presence, there was nothing we could do, right? We needed the gracious act of Jesus who came not because we asked him, but because he wanted to. The, there was nothing we could do, but it doesn't mean there's nothing that we're not, that there's not something we're not supposed to do. And that supposed to do is what I want to talk about today. You know, it's, we couldn't have done it on our own. We can't, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to, to do. And so, is it just enough to believe? Well, some say, yeah, I believe, and then we know what James says, the devils believe, right, and tremble. So, what does it mean to, be re- to believe? What does it mean to have this whole issue resolved? And the question comes down to the heart. And so, this is kind of where we left off last, last time. You know... Um, I think I threw this out there that, you know, in the, in the olden days, the heart, as we think of, like, with Valentine's Day past, well, the heart is where you, you know, love, and you have these little heart symbols you send on Valentine's Day. In the olden days, the heart went, meant the mind. It meant the will. It meant your choices. And this, the heart of man, you know, is, is where every good act, good will, good gesture to your neighbor has been conceived. The, the heart of man is where every act of war has been declared. You know, uh, without the heart of man in, in this earth, there is there's no sin. It's where sin dwells. It's, it's where good works overcome sin. But without the heart of man, there's no battle. The, the battle is for your heart. The battle is for the, to influence your choices. And will you choose God or will you not choose Him? And so the battle is the heart. And so when the Scriptures talk about the heart... They, they talk about that, all right? It's your will. You know, the, when they talked about love, it was the bowels, right? I think I threw that out there. You know, they, and we don't, we don't want to go there, all right? So it was a little different metaphor in, in that day. So when they talked about, you know, the condition of your heart, it wasn't just the love we think. It's the condition of your attitude, your life, your purpose. What you think of determines what you do. And that's what God wants to win, Okay, so, so the answer, and I'm going to throw this out there, and I'm going to spend the rest of the class kind of justifying it. The answer is that you must be spiritually changed. You must be spiritually changed. And I'm, I'm going to get to the scripture in a second, but remember, um, I think we shared from John 3 last time, that the famous scripture, For God so loved the world, you know, is in this chapter, but it begins with a visitor who comes to Jesus by night. A man named Nicodemus, and he's not just any man. This man is a ruler of the Jews, okay, and one of the chief priests. But even more importantly, he's of the group that in the day, the, in the Hebrew, they called the Parashim. We call it Pharisees, all right? John 3, a Pharisee comes to Jesus by night, and he says, hey, 
We've, I've seen the things you're doing, and no one can do the things you're doing unless God is with them. And, and then the implication is then, so what do I need to do? Now, this is coming from a man who, you know, the, the Pharisees memorized the scriptures. They, they would have had the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized by heart. The law of God, the 613 aspects of the law of Moses, they had them down pat. They could tell them just like you could name your children, right? These were conditions, and, and they separated themselves by ritual washings, things that were commanded in the Old Testament. They, they, they separated themselves in a class because they did not want to be mingling with people who may have been unclean. So these were separate people. These, these were physically on the outside, having every aspect of adherence to God's law. And this man then, of, who's the leader of these people, who wants to know the truth, comes into Jesus' presence and says, so what do I need to do? And, he, and Jesus basically says to him, you're clean on the outside. He says, your problem is you need to be clean on the inside. And, and how does he say that to him? He says, he says, and if you want to turn to John 3, marvel not. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that's John chapter 3, verse 3. He says, verily I say unto you, except you're born again. So born again, what does that mean? What does that mean? Isn't born again what happens when I get baptized? I mean, you're having a baptismal service today, right? That's, isn't that born again? That's, that's how I told myself growing up that I was born again because I was baptized, right? And so the... The text continues, and, and Nicodemus says, well, I can, can I enter my mother's womb again? You know, he's, he's really wanting to know. And so, um, so Jesus explains even further. He says, hey, except uh, you're born of the water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. But born of, born of. The word born of, you take it back into the, the Greek and in the Hebrew and all that, and it, and it means to be changed. It needs to be made new. Like, like when a baby comes into the world and takes that first breath. They're, they're made new. And Jesus is saying to this man, you want to know the truth? The truth is you've got to be changed. You've got to be made new spiritually. And so how does that happen? How does that happen? Um, Jesus continues the story and tells this man, Hey, he said, you were a ruler, you're a ruler of the Jews, and you should know this story. Maybe you know the story, but you might not know what it means. He said, when Moses and his people were bitten by fiery flying serpents and some were dying, what did Moses do? He said, he just took this fiery flying serpent, put it on a pole, lifted it up to the people, and said, hey, if you want to be healed, if you were bitten, just look over here at this pole. And some of the people said, well, that's too easy. That's stupid. I'm not going to do that. And they, and they died, right? But the people who looked, and it, simply look at the pole, guys, and see the snake, just look, and you'll be healed. It was too easy. They wouldn't do it, but some did, and they were healed. So Jesus says, in this same chapter, he says, as Moses, verse 14, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of God be lifted up, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And this in the context is why he then says, because God loved you so much, he sent me into the world that whosoever would believe or look to me would not perish, but have everlasting life. He said, it's that easy. He said, you look to me for what reason? So your heart can be changed, right? So your hearts can be changed. And so how does that work? How does that work? We're going to talk about a couple stories of people in the Book of Mormon, and one of them, well, we'll just, we'll just get to it. Um, we can call him the destroyer. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to Messiah chapter 11 <clears throat> in the Book of Mormon. So, uh, beginning at verse, well, if you, if you know the story, <coughs> you can read the context and maybe verses starting at verse 150, 160. Um, the story starts out with Alma's son. Now, Alma was the guy who lived in King Noah's court. This prophet Abinadi comes through and starts preaching, and they want to kill Abinadi, and we'll talk about that after a while, why, why they wanted to kill him. And they did. 
But one priest in the court says, hey, I think we should listen to this guy. Well, King Noah was so wroth, cast him out too. And this young priest who didn't know anything other than this guy's words, prophet sounds right, starts writing these words down. And he's Alma, and he takes people in the wilderness, and they are blessed by the Spirit of God. And they institute baptism, and these people rejoin in Zarahemla. And Alma now becomes the chief priest of the land. And he's got this son who, you know, pastor's kid maybe, I don't know what, but he, uh, he didn't want to conform. So Alma Jr. and the sons of Mosiah were out trying to destroy the church. Right? They, they wanted to tear down everything his father built up. Now, I would ask you this, if you're... If any of you have ever served in the role of any kind of leadership in the church or been a member or whatever, you know, and especially if your name's Alma and you've baptized people in the wilderness, what are the chances that your son named Alma was not baptized, right? I mean, you know, yeah, you were forced to go to church whether you wanted to or not. You probably got baptized. You probably did the things that your parents told you to do as a child. And then you get a little older and you think, well, I don't know if you were right, Mom. You know, I... Dad, that just sounds kind of weird, all your, all your stuff about what happened in the wilderness. And so, so that's Alma's son. And Alma Jr. is going around destroying the work that his father and others had done. And then he's confronted by an angel. And the words of this angel shake the earth. And it's, it's, it's like, wow. Um, so that happens to Alma. And then if you recall in the story... Alma kind of falls down dead. And his dad and others pray for two days and two nights. And after that time period, they realize Alma's starting to move. He's going to say something. Let's hear what he has to say. This is Alma Jr. who was destroying the church. So in verse 184, uh, Mosiah 11, 184. And also they prayed that his limbs might receive their, their strength, that the eyes of the people might be open to see and know of the goodness of the glory of God. And it came to pass, after they had fasted for the space of two days and two nights, the limbs of Alma <clears throat> received their strength, and he stood up and began to speak unto them, bidding them be of good comfort. And he says, I have repented of my sins. I have been redeemed of the Lord. And behold, I am, what's it say? I'm born of the Spirit. I'm born of the Spirit, right? I am changed. I have been changed on the inside. This is the change Jesus was telling Nicodemus has to happen. This happened to a man who was two days earlier in a sinful way. But what happened? What happened? He said, well, let's read more of what he has to say. He said, I've repented of my sins. He said, I've been born of the Spirit, verse 187. And the Lord said to me, marvel not that all mankind, yea, men, women, nations, kindreds, tongues, and people must be born again. You must be changed. You must be spiritually changed on the inside. And he says, yea, and he explains this, born of God, changed from their carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness, being redeemed of God, becoming his sons and daughters. And thus they become new creatures. And unless they do this, it says what? You can in no wise inherit the kingdom. See, that's what the message has been all along is that for the justice, because of sin, being cast out of God's presence, it took a payment of infinite price. So God himself atones for the sins of mankind. But the problem is we have to respond to him. And the way we respond is to allow his spirit into us. And if we allow his spirit, which comes by the gift of the Holy Ghost, it works on that inner man. It works on the sinful state. And sometimes it happens slowly over a lifetime. Sometimes it happens immediately. But the fact is, it's got to happen. It's got to happen to each one of us, or we are not with God in His kingdom. The choice is we have to respond to the Spirit of God. <coughs> now, any thoughts or comments right there? I'm going to keep going here for a little bit, but I just want to see. Yes, Brother Ron. Here's... That's a, that's a great question, and I probably will spend the rest of the class answering that in this way. You can partly describe it by simply the descriptions of people whose hearts were changed. And know if we're on this path. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us from here to 
Mosiah records in Mosiah 11 Alma Jr.'s response, right? But Alma becomes the high priest later, and he's preaching through the land. In the third chapter of Alma, he's preaching not just one sermon, but multiple sermons, and he asks over 40 questions in one chapter. You go through and you listen, and you've seen some of these, you've heard some of them, but to put it in the context, he's saying, my calling, my, my purpose is to tell people that they must be born again. And he asks questions like, have you received his image in your countenance? Right? And, 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 and we're going to get to these here in a minute. But the, the change, and, and, and he's not asking just the world, he's asking the people of the church. We'll, we'll get to this in a second. But the change happens when, when this happens. And, and Ron, just to respond to your question, if you, if you will, everyone, just turn to Mosiah 3, a, a few chapters earlier. At the end of King Benjamin's speech to, to the people, King Benjamin is speaking to the people of Zarahemla. This is, this is before Alma's conversion. And he preaches this powerful sermon and he tells them things that you're, you're asking about, Ronnie. He's telling them things about, hey, when you're in the service of your fellow being, you're only in the service of God, right? And, and those are the, and, and he, he asked many, um, he asked them to consider the attributes of their life. And when they hear these words, Mosiah chapter 3 and in verse 2, he wants to know what they think about these things that he's asked them. And they say, Mosiah 3 verse 2, they all cried with one voice saying, Yea, we believe all the words which thou hast spoken to us, and also we know of their surety and truth because of the Spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us, or in our hearts, He's saying the same thing. He said, somehow God's spirit, because of these words, we believe God's spirit has entered into us. It's bringing about a change that we can feel already for this reason. Notice how this verse ends. Because we have no more disposition to do evil. Now that's powerful. If that's the definition of being born again, having no more disposition to evil, how many of us are born again? Don't raise your hand. Because I'm not raising my hand. Thanks. Well, I'm glad you're sitting up front, too. Oh, <laughs> you're the only guy with your hand up, I guess. That's it. Go ahead. King David, in 51 in the Psalms, <laughs> says this to God. He says, hide your face from my sin, but blot out my iniquities. And in the garden, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were without sin. They were in the presence of God. They got to commune with them, talk with them, and they're in the garden. And when they got kicked out, they also had the Spirit of God within them. And they also were given the Scriptures, and they knew God. He didn't like kick them out of the garden and say, you're lost. He kicked them out of the garden. And because of the great gift, which is mentioned in Genesis 3, of why we the whole thing is brought about is because of the creation of man and that the nature of man is quite contrary to the nature of God and we weren't going to be allowed in his kingdom. So then you have the Christ that's the ultimate sacrifice and what he did on the cross for us. But it all has to do with our agency. And to be born again is to throw away everything you have. All your being is for Christ. And we know that through Paul, his name was Saul, and look at his conversion, how he turned it around and became one of the greatest apostles in the church. And yeah, no, I appreciate that. And we're going to talk a little bit about Adam. Um, Ron, I want to just come back to you and say, is there something you'd like to add to your question? I, I'm, I'm just trying to say that the, the, there's more scriptures I want to talk about, but basically the change brings about a change in our disposition. And if the change in our disposition occurs, we desire to do good works. And they, they might not be all the, all the same because God works with us individually. But, but the point is, He leads us. And, and I'm, I wanna, I'm gonna go to Genesis here in just a second. Thanks for uh, opening up with that, Roger. But was there something you'd like to add, Ron? And, and, that's, and that's, where I'm, that's, that's exactly where I'm going. And that's, that, this, is the, this is the point. Some, some people would say, well, Jesus did it all, there's nothing I have to do. And that's not the point. The point is, Jesus did it all, and there's nothing I could have done. But our response is, what James, uh, the book of James says is, God calls us unto good works, because 
the works are the evidence that our heart was changed. That's what it means. It's not that our works in and of themselves could have been stacked up and it's like, oh, that made up the difference for what Jesus couldn't do. No, an infinite payment had to be made where God steps out of eternity into time, takes on human flesh, hangs on a cross, crucified by his own creation in their hands because that allowed... That allowed our repentance to have any, our change to have any effect. We could have changed all we wanted. We could have repented all day long. We could have prayed on our knees from sunup till sundown every day of our life. And it wouldn't have mattered without that payment. So when we stand before God, and, and turn, if you will, to Matthew 25, Jesus was telling it how it is, and it's... <clears throat> He simply, you, you, know this, you know the story, um, just put it in context of what we're saying. In Matthew 25, starting at um, verse 32, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory. Okay, so we've just established something. The Son of Man coming in His glory. This is like a time of judgment, Right? And all the holy angels with him, and sit on the throne of his glory. Behold, him shall be, before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided sheep from the goats, the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. So he's got the whole world standing before him. He's coming in his glory, and he's got two sides. You go to the right or you go to the left. Now why? And he sits on his throne and he says, to those on his right, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was, I was naked and you gave me something to wear. And sick and you visited me. All these things. Now notice what he doesn't say. He says, stand on my right hand because I was saved by grace and you simply believe that I did that, so you're here. You know, what's interesting is what this comes down to, and this is in everyone's Bible, not just the inspired version, is this judgment is by works. Our judge, our, we are judged by our works, not saved by our works. We're judged because if our works were works of righteousness, it shows what? That our heart was changed. And he says to these people, he says, you, he said, they, they answer and they say, well, when did we do this? He said, well, if you did it to any of these, the least of these, you've done it unto me. So he's saying that the good people of the earth are divided from the bad people of the earth for this simple reason, that the evidence of your life shows that your heart was changed. And if your heart was changed, Jesus washes away the sin. He said, that's what it comes down to. That's, it, it's not that you even, I, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, you can throw tomatoes at me anytime you want. Just, I give you that option. But, you know, it, it's not that you end up having stood before God at that last day and you didn't have a sin in your life. You know, these questions perplex people when they get into doctrinal issues. Uh, a friend I know is a pastor, and I asked him, I said, so what happens when this Christian dies in a car accident, had a sin on his or her record before she dies and it wasn't resolved, versus... The man on the gallows who lived a sinful life and before the noose is placed around his neck, he says, I forgive me, Lord. And they're both dead. Which one goes to heaven and which one doesn't? And, and, and the question isn't, these things are easy for, for God to resolve because he's the perfect judge. He's the author of justice and he looks at the heart. And, and it's not a question of was there one sin because he knows that all mankind has sin. The point is that if your heart changed, he says, I can wash it away. That's what our response is. And, our, and, our, and it comes to us this way. It comes to us this way. You see, we of the church think, well, man, I, I, I thought it was about coming to Jackson County, and I thought it was coming to this, and I thought it was learning, you know, in the Goyan teaching. We've got the little church, and it tells us about the priesthood responsibilities and all these things. And it's like, I thought it was faith and repentance. I mean, aren't we supposed to just preach faith and repentance, right? Well, Helaman 5 if you want to turn there, um, when Samuel the Lamanite, and this is an interesting point because Samuel being a Lamanite, he was one of the bad guys. And the Lamanites were the bad guys. And the Lamanites were converted, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. And he's a product of that conversion. 
But he says this. He says, verse 96, Helaman chapter 5, verse 96. And, and to preface this, he, he talks about the, the wicked abominations of the fathers, and yet he talks about the holy writings of the prophets. And in verse 96, he's, he's talking about the prophecies of the prophets that would, would bring people to righteousness. He said, the prophets, prophecies of the holy prophets which are written, which leadeth them to faith on the Lord and unto repentance, which faith and repentance bringeth a change of heart unto them. And the point of this, and without taking time to expand the context, he's simply saying that, hey, the, the word of God brings you to faith, and it brings you to want to change. And faith and repentance are what we're supposed to talk about, right? Why? Because they bring you to a change of heart. And if that change of heart happens in your life, God washes away the sin. That's, that's, that's the gospel. Now, if you're, if you're like me, you're wondering, well, isn't that, that's just kind of weird. Isn't that kind of just like, that's not what the gospel has, was from the beginning, is it? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it is. I'm thankful that we have the inspired version to help us understand this because Roger already mentioned Genesis 3. What's Genesis 3? Genesis 3 is the story of justice. Adam and Eve, you sinned. You're cast out of my presence. By the way, here's some coats of skins to keep you warm. You'll need these while you're toiling by the sweat of your brow and bearing children, right, through difficulty. There's not this class, but maybe in a class to come, we'll, we'll talk about some symbolism that's set up in Genesis. It's beautiful. But one of them, why, why do you think God told the woman that she was going to have children, but now it's going to be hard? And you're, that's, that's, I mean, it's, it's certainly not easy, but, you know, I mean, if you've been through childbirth or you've been with your wife or someone, but, but it's true, it's the way it is for everyone. I mean, it's a challenge, right? There's a symbol there. The, the wife represents the church, right? And the child represents the kingdom. And here's the point. The kingdom is going to come forth now, but because of sin, it comes into the world through much difficulty, Right? The, the, the merging of God, this final prophecy, is, is this kingdom of God coming to earth again. But it comes through difficulty. It comes through toil. And it will come, right? It will come. And the, the, the difficulty in childbirth is a constant reminder of the world that that's going to happen. But Genesis 3, we get the justice of God. Man is cast out of God's presence, right? Genesis 3. And Genesis 4, in the inspired version... Beautiful illustration because Adam's now cast out, commanded to offer sacrifices, doesn't know why until an angel comes and says, do you know why you're doing this, Adam? He goes, no, I just know God told me to. And he says, this is what? This is a similitude or an example of the sacrifice of the only begotten, this infinite sacrifice to take away the sin of the world. So Genesis 3, we have Adam living in justice, right? Separation from God. Genesis 4, we find that a payment was going to be made, right? And so what about Adam's response? Oh, just kill these, kill these lambs and that's enough? Well, then turn to Genesis 6. Genesis 6, Enoch is already on the scene. Now, Adam is actually still alive. Adam and Seth and some of the others, which is why in Adam's or Enoch's ripe young years of 65 age, he calls himself a lad, not because of maybe his age, how we define, but because the greats were still alive. Adam and Seth, they were still alive, and, and Enoch was alive. And he's like, call on these guys, you know? He said, I'm slow of speech. People hate me. And, and so what does God do? He says, oh, I can take care of that. You know what happens to Enoch? It says he became so powerful, this guy who was slow of speech, so powerful in his speech that people couldn't stand in his presence and the earth trembled. Right? That's what God does. Same thing when Isaiah comes to the Lord and the Lord says, hey, I want you to be my spokesman. And what does Isaiah say? He says, um, I'm this man of unclean lips. Um, I dwell in a people of unclean lips, which is all meaning like, God, I, I cuss a little, you know? I, my people, we tell off-color jokes. And so what does God do? I mean, he sends the angel to the altar, takes this coal, touches his lips, he says, there are your sins purged. That's being baptized by fire and the Holy Ghost. That's being changed. And now this man who liked to cuss sings the praises of God. Right? His heart was changed. And it was changed symbolically. 
So what happened with, with Adam? And we'll end class probably with this for today. And we got more we got to talk about, but that's all right. It's all good. So in Genesis 6, Enoch is preaching a sermon. And in this sermon, he recounts Adam's experience. And Adam falls and he explains the fall in Genesis 6, 49. But for sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead to what Enoch was telling these people that Adam told the world. Jump to verse 61, Genesis 6 in the inspired version, 61. I give unto you a commandment. Teach these things freely to your children, saying, Hey, by reason of transgression came the fall, and by the fall came death. He said, we're cast out of God's presence. That's death. That's, that's our first death. That's spiritual death. That's temporal death that we will all face, that God didn't come to save us from. He came to save us from the spiritual death. He says, So inasmuch as you're born into the world by water and the blood and the spirit, which I have made, and became a living soul... So every human that came into this world, and if you've witnessed the birth, there is water, there is blood, and when that baby first emerges, the very first thing it does is it takes a breath, right? Yeah, it's alive. See, that's why God says, I breathed into Adam, I formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, and this dust I breathed life into. And so when this baby comes forth in the world from the water and the blood and has life, that's symbolic of God's creation of everything in the world, right? And that's, but he says, but just like this happened in the physical world, it has to happen to you spiritually. Now notice it uses the same words in verse 62. Even so, just like you were born temporally, physically, you must be born again into the kingdom of heaven. You must be changed or born spiritually. He says, of water... That water is you make a covenant in baptism, right? That's, that locks it in. That's your thing you can hold on to. Say, Lord, I, I took that step. I witnessed unto you that I wanted to follow. But notice what it says. He, Adam's the first person being told you've got to be born again. If, if that point isn't obvious, it's right here. You have to be changed by your covenant, he says, and then born of the Spirit, that Spirit that burns, that purges that iniquity out of you. He said, and cleansed by the blood... The blood because of this infinite atonement that was offered on your behalf. That's the grace. He says that you can be sanctified from sin and enjoy the words of eternal life in this world and the world come. 63, by the water you keep the commandment, the spirit justifies you and the blood cleans you, right? But notice what happens. Jump ahead now to 65. He says, this is the plan of salvation to all men. This is the plan, that you have to come to God, His Spirit enters you, it cleanses the sin from you, and if you can, if you abide by that, and in the dirt at the end, He washes the sin away. And so what happens? What happens? So Adam, verse 67, Adam cried unto the Lord. He was caught away by the Spirit of the Lord. He was carried down in the water, was laid under the water, so he brought his baptism. He was brought forth out of the water. He was baptized. Notice this. The Spirit of God descends upon him. And thus he was born of the Spirit and became quickened in the inner man. Which means what? He was instantly changed in that moment. He was instantly changed. Now, is our change always instant? No. Faith and repentance take us there. But the fact is that we change. If I know we're, out, we're just about at that, what is it, 1040? Is that usually when they open the door? You lock the door, maybe. Say, give, me, give me a second. So, so, this instant change. Turn back to Helaman, if you will. And we're, we're not going to get to Elm 3 today. We'll save that for next time. We're not going to get even into Helaman 2 like I'd like to. But. All, this, all these scriptures, by the way, if you look in this book or online, uh, you see a section called the Change of Heart. I think you'll find these scriptures there if you're, if you're taking notes or if you're not. It's, it's all there. But there's a Lehi and a Nephi, the descendants of the original, preaching. And they're, they're desirous to take the word back to the Lamanites. The Lamanites, to use a term I've heard in our day in the vernacular, 
These were the drunken Indians, okay? These were the savages. These were the ones who lived without God. These were the ones who loved beating up the good guys, right? That's, that's what they loved. They, they loved to fight, right? And so they're preaching in their land, and this group of savages, next time, we'll do it next time. We're going to start, but there's a Lehi and a Nephi, the descendants of the original, preaching. And they're, they're desirous to take the word back to the Lamanites. The Lamanites, to use a term I've heard in our day in the vernacular, these were the drunken Indians, okay? These were the savages. These were the ones who lived without God. These were the ones who loved beating up the good guys, right? That's, that's what they loved. They, they loved to fight, right? And so they're preaching in their land, and this group of savages... Next time. We'll do it next time. We're going to start in Helam in chapter 2 next time. And I'm just going to get hit the ground running. We're going to go. And it's not going to snow. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.